Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me, guys. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, so I will talk about, um, I guess, a continuation of the earlier cervical one, which the intrafacet cages, which are these titanium cages, they wanted me to talk about the lumbar, but ironically, I just recently started using the lumbar, so I have less than 10 cases. So I'll go through this cervical, very different story. I've used it for quite a few years, almost 10. And um, it's definitely been a game changer for how I approach stuff, especially deformity. Um, okay, so I will, oh, first let me just mention disclosures uh, of a paid consultant uh, for Providence. Um, the basically, I uh, my hesitation was in February 2024 or January, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. The FDA got uh, approved the lumbar usage of this intrafacet, and then there was a little bit of a delay on my end for using it just because I didn't know where exactly it would fit into my practice and how it could help the patients. Um, but to start with. Um, then there have been since then, earlier this year, I've started using it. Um, once I thought there it really could be a good, unique usage that could fill out sort of the, maybe the deficits in, the, in, the, in my current practice. Um, and I don't have long-term data, and so that's why, uh, that I personally have, but I'll present stuff that the company has done trials with. Um, so I guess for me it was, huh, what, what am I going to do with this lumbar interfacet cage? Uh, where can it fit into what I'm already doing? I was pretty happy with percutaneous screws that we all pretty much do to back back up some of our lumbar cases. Um, uh, and but we can see that there is a bit of a shortfall, right? I mean, the A lifts have been notoriously quite quite robust in terms of long term fusion, uh, lateral lumbar inner bodies. I've stayed away from standalones because of this data and some of my early cases when I started doing laterals um, that didn't fuse when they did standalones very well. So. Um, I have always sort of backed it up now, um, more recently. And then um, T-lifts, I've actually tried to go away from T-lifts for the same sort of reason. I only do it if I can't do a A-lift or an O-lift or an X-lift. Um, okay, and so we kind of know already the risk factors that we all sort of deal with, and I don't see this lessening over time. If anything, I feel like I see more patients that are obese, um, especially here. Um, than, than I remember seeing 20 years ago. Um, age, I, I don't know, but there's certainly plenty there. The only thing I've seen come down perhaps is the people with uh, nicotine use. Um, so the limitations uh, that we talk about, like where can we fill this out? Where is this gonna fill in as an intrafacet cage in the lumbar spine has always been something that's, like I said, sort of caused delay on my end to use it. Um, but clearly, pedicle screws, if you think about it, it uh, theoretically, and I'll present the theory that the company puts forth that seriously, uh, significantly applies to the cervical, and that's what got me on, interested in the cervical, and it certainly uh, bears out long-term to be true for that. Um, and hopefully, it'll be the same with the lumbar. Um, but there are some problems with, you know, that it's not a perfect fix, the percutaneous, although they're relatively easy now, with especially with the navigation and uh, plus or minus robotics, but I was hoping that maybe the lumbar system will uh, be an adjunct to that or replace some of the times where I can't put a percutaneous screw in. Um, okay, so here basically just to run through some of the theory, right? So we all know this. I mean, the fixation points, what's always intrigued me about the intrafacet cages are we we're looking at the facet joint to see if there's a successful fusion, but we're putting screws across it. So it always made sense that if we could just get the bone to grow through that joint, well, then we've achieved our fusion. So in that regard, this system makes a lot of sense in theory again. Um, so the other idea is, of course, and this bears out very uh, is in, a, in a sort of dramatic fashion in the cervical spine, which is the high quality of bone in the, at the interface, basically in the facet. And there are times where I can't use lateral mass screws with any sort of confidence because the bone is so bad or they pull out very, very easily. But so other than going to cervical pedicle screws, the other option with this has been uh, some of the older sort of population where the bone I know is bad has been very useful for that group in the cervical spine and by definition perhaps maybe also in the lumbar spine. 
Um, so this particular system is very similar to the, uh, um, in terms of the structure of this cage. So it goes in between the interior and articular, uh, I mean, in, t in between the articular processes. And it's got two screws. The new version has two screws, which is one going into the SAP and one going into the IAP. And it's uh, a pretty straightforward system in terms of placing it. It's actually, I think, easier, especially with navigation, to place it into the lumbar spine than it can be in the cervical spine, especially at the lower joints. Um, and the system, just to run through it, yeah, I mean, this is obviously not something that's going to compel you to use it, but it, it, it is a nice benefit, which is it's all disposable. And it's great because I don't have to worry about if the SPD has, you know, you know inadvertently caused the contamination. When it's opened up, it's like, it's all there, and that's the entire set. You don't really need much else, especially you'll see the size of these incisions, and you've already heard about it, actually, for the cervical. So very much the same thing. And it really just sits in. you got to navigate accurately into that facet joint. And like I said, using stealth specifically for the lumbar spine, it's, it's really, I mean, I'll, I'll just let the residents do it because, um, well, first, we could watch them, and secondly, because it's so easy to sort of pick up with the navigation. Um, the other thing is here, so basically this just demonstrates uh, usage through this stealth. I mean, uh, it really is. It's easier than cervical. Like I said, I've struggled on some cervicals, like he had mentioned earlier, on bigger patients, or 6'7", especially, or 7'1", or, or even bigger patients when the shoulders get in the way. But here you don't have that issue. There are other issues here, but not that. Um, with the spine, so then I usually just do single position if I'm backing them, uh, backing up somebody. And I, again, the usage of when, when am I going to use this and why is it going to displace uh, percutaneous screws? And so for me, the big thing was when we see these patients who have adjacent segment disease, they come in with a construct, whether you've done it or somebody else has done it, and they have a disc up top, and I've always had to, and I really want to do a decompression posteriorly, and I, you know, you have to open them up, and it's such a big such a big deal to them to go through. And, and it's not fun, I mean, to go down there and, and, and go through the scar and get, and get the rods out and then put in extra screws and whatever. And usually it's a different system than we use or whatever the case may be. So this was the most compelling reason for me to move to at least try trying these. So now I would basically do an adjacent segment OLIF or XLIF and then in single position just put these in and not worry about the rod below. And they so far haven't had, even on some of the longer rods I've seen, haven't... Um, prevented me from accessing the joint. Um, some more information that, again, isn't going to blow you away, but if we add this posterior, uh, basically the facet joint in the lumbar spine, it, if you take the average of the three different inner bodies we could use, it, obviously, especially the uh, laterals and the ellipse putting in most of it, you're adding about 20% uh, of a surface area for direct bony fusion. So, I mean, that again, in theory, speaks pretty strongly uh, for this system. Uh, again, this uh, is a nice thing too, right? So we know this is some of the best bone, even in people with osteoporosis. Uh, the articular surfaces are quite solid. And so the rationale here is, is that you can get good, good uh, fixation, uh, which we do see. And the question will be is, do we get good bony fusion across this joint? Um, but you can see here just the numbers through a study that, you know, clearly, again, nothing surprising that the vertebral body itself has sort of the lowest bone mineral density. Um, and then biomechanical data. Um, again, qu question of how much clinical significance this has is, is another topic. But clearly, again, nothing um, very surprising here. But when, when, when these joints are fixed in the back, it's not hard to imagine why there's less movement across screws that are put in that are, you know, basically uh, adjacent to the joint. Um, and so that's what this shows. And then clinical outcomes. And this, I think, um, it's worth discussing a little bit because this is sort of what I'm looking at closely at my patients as they come back. Um, so the outcomes, so what they, what they demonstrated in this study was that they have this huge 96% fusion, but as you can see that a lot of that is defined as less than you know five degrees of motion on the X-ray, on the dynamic X-ray. Whereas um, the bridging bone over a CT, and most importantly, in my opinion, the pain improvement is you know a little bit uh, a bit lower, and so and and comparable, incidentally. So what I'm looking at for my post ops, and right now I have about three and four months, but I only have three month CTs. I haven't had the six months or or a year CT yet. 
Um, I want to see bridging bone just because I felt, um, at least in the past, uh, in other systems, that that's really correlated pretty well with outcome. Does it, again, it's not 100%, of course, but uh, better than I would say the motion on an x-ray would be. And maybe it's simply because I can't seem to pick up a subtle difference on an x-ray. Um, so the navigation system here is something that they had shown. And so here's a joint, and this is what they're uh, basically describing as on their post-op CT, that they're seeing bone grow through this. I'm seeing something similar to this in, in, in my post-op CTs, but I haven't seen the sort of big bony overlay that we see in the cervical spine. So, um, but I'll, I'll get to that. Um, and then, so some of the patients I'll just present. So like, like I said, my most compelling thing was, uh, uh, was adjacent segment disease. That's what drew me to this. I was like, there's no way, if I don't have to go in and deal with the old rods, I'm not gonna do it, you know? And um, it's been great as far as that goes so far, but it's early. Um, then some of the other indications that people have used are contralateral MIS T lift. I've only done one for that. So it is true. I think I, when I looked at my data, when I saw this indication, I looked at my data and I do have less success on uh, fusions for my MIS T lifts versus my T lifts. So I still will do them, but I try to be extra cautious on, you know, and I throw BMP in there as well. So I've done this on my last, um, one, uh, my last one recently, uh, MIST lift, where I've put in the cage and the contralateral facet through one of the percutaneous screw holes. Um, the supplemental pedicle screws does make sense, and maybe that would be an indication that I haven't done it. Uh, I'm sure others have around the country. Uh, and a standalone backup for a lumbar lateral, I haven't done either until I get some of the other data on the adjacent segments. Then I will do it. I'm not against that. That would be, it's a lot easier. And there's one incidentally, one patient. In fact, I think he's the first one I'll bring up here. This, this is again, it's the same type of thing uh, in terms of simplifying the MIS. If, if that bears out in, in mind, you know, because even though somebody else may get great success results, you know, I may, or it gets great fusion results. If I don't get them, I'm, I'm not going to do it. So I'm still waiting for my long-term data, but here's the adjacent segment on a very interesting patient. So this is a guy who's very in tune, very athletic. I mean, even to a crazy amount at 68, riding dirt bikes competitively and so on. So he comes uh, after having a, had a T lift quite a while ago um, and in great shape, clearly had, it doesn't want surgery, but clearly needs it based on adjacent segment disease. And just um, to cut to the chase, he uses three months, so he did well post-op. And the one thing he, so I did two levels above his prior fusion because he had quite a bit of uh, degeneration and foraminal stenosis there. And um, this is the one right above, and then the second one here at three months. And those little dots you see are, are sort of just the screws I talked to you about, about going into the IAP and SAP. The, um, but I, I don't, I wanna see a little more bony fusion. Now he's doing fine still early. So I think the hardware itself can hold sort of the rigidity and immobilization. So I want to see if that will grow over. Um, but the interesting thing he told me was he remembers, and he's just so in tune with his body that I tend to believe it, but of course it's anecdotal, is that the difference between getting these perk uh, cages in compared to the perk screws he had the previous time um, at a different place, it was huge. Like, you know, and he brought that up on by himself, and I thought, ah, oh, that's interesting. So, I mean, I guess it makes sense because it does seem very, very less, uh, very much less invasive. And you can do them through one incision, which we have started to do, kind of like Dr. Nunley was talking about. So this other one is not my case, but this is the contralateral um, facet joint for MIST lifts that others have done in the country, and they have seen some good results. And like I said, mine is just way too early. Um, so this is a patient who came in, decided that he was going to do an MIS TLF on this patient. Um, and, um, his, so he had a grade one spondy, um, not significant movement, but perhaps a little bit. Um, so I don't think pathologic movement and, um, clear stenosis, clear collapse, did his MIS TLF. And, um, he also was worried, you know, that, Hey, sometimes I get these uh, subs uh, subsidence of the grafts, especially with MIS, where I think you have maybe a limited, especially contralaterally, uh, of good decortication and bone f 
uh, formation and foundation. So he puts in this cage, and this is what I did basically through one of those holes. So it's not like you're doing an extra incision. You could easily navigate this through with their system using the stealth and get a um, contralateral fixation. And so it'll be interesting because if this gives me better results on the MIST lift, I'll definitely put more of them in. Um, and then this last one, this was what started it for me, this case. This guy comes to me, had a T-lift, again, adjacent segment disease. He had an L4-S1 T-lift a while ago. He's huge, BMI of greater than 48 and just a really, really big guy. And had stenosis and the last, and he'd been turned down by many people. And I also wasn't excited to do this gentleman. Uh, but you can see here why. I mean, I really, I think he needs a decompression as well. And that's another reason I think people didn't want to just do a, maybe an indirect. And again, nor did I. Um, but thanks to what Christoph has brought, we can combine it with the endoscope. So what we did here was an OLIF on this gentleman, which as you guys know, doing an OLIF on this kind of guy is not too big a deal, uh, other than the actual positioning of him. But once he's positioned and the incision's made, it's not too, too bad. And then, so we did an OLIF, and then we navigated the, uh, the cages above the screw. Um, and then these are his three months. Is, uh, yeah, this is his three months CT. Yeah, this is his three months CT. So again, I'm not seeing great bony, at least what I expect to see, and maybe I'll never see it. But he is also starting to have a little more pain now. So I don't know what to make. He's still better than he was before surgery, but let's see. So I'm really curious to see because this is a guy I would also not want to touch. Um, and I don't think just doing the endoscopic decompression without the fixation would, would probably do him well long term. Um, but anyway, so I think everybody's going to have to sort of assess this themselves, but the data is coming out. And if you think it could be an adjunct in your practice, well, I think it'd be good. If it ends up fusing well, then I um, will certainly use it. Uh, for adjacent segments and then expand it, just like cervical, sort of expanded organically. It started pretty small, and now I use it in all kinds of ways. Um, okay, thanks a lot.